So I'm Simon Rabinowitz. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist. I started off and returned to Downstate in the middle. I was the chairman of pediatrics also at Rumsey. That's how come I have part of my affiliation with Staten Island. Prior to that, I started the pediatric gastroenterology service at Staten Island University Hospital, and I was there for about uh, 10 years. I have an interest in eosinophilic esophagitis, and I have uh, been involved with it, taking care of kids with it for over 10 years now. In January of this year, the ESPAGAN, which is the European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition, uh, convened a group of experts and came up with first set of guidelines specifically uh, designed for children. And so I felt that it would be valuable to share with the group. Reasonable to understand that there's really many issues, but the two uh, or two which are a primary is that <clears throat> there are certain questions that remain without an answer in the year 2014. And so you're going to have to rely on using the available information and your doctors. The other part is that, unfortunately, not all the doctors are as knowledgeable as they could or should be about what is known. And so sometimes children provided with opinion or treatment that is not, uh, so to speak, up to date. So there were two sets of guidelines that were published, 2007, 2011. Both of those guidelines were produced for patients who are both childs and adults. Uh, the present ones are exclusively for children and adults. And as I've alluded to, they are based on scientific evidence. And in those scenarios where they do not have adequate scientific information, uh, it's what's referred to as expert opinion and personal practice. For today's talk, virtually all of the material will be coming from those individuals. There are a few places where my own opinion and practice is in variance and I probably will at least mention some of them. Prevalence and incidence. So the number of cases um, that are new which is called the incidence, and the number overall of cases of eosinophilic esophagitis is rapidly increasing. So one in 10,000 children are being diagnosed every year in a total of four of 10,000 children, so one in 25,000 children. So uh, this is certainly underestimate. So if there is approximately 250,000 children in Staten Island, it would suggest that only 40 have EOE, and there's probably three or four times as many. Um, about 3% of the endoscopies that are done on kids um, at not only my center, but we looked at this with certain other colleagues, uh, wind up having eosinophilic esophagitis. So one out of 30 kids who are being sent wind up with that diagnosis. And so the question that is unanswered is whether this represents the fact that there are so many new kids who are having the disease or it's just better recognized than ever before. And it's likely a combination of both. So what are the features of pediatric EOE? Anyone in the room have a daughter or girl with the condition? Okay, so you see that most common in boys is usually about three to one. It's more common in patients who have atopic or allergic diseases. And by that, I mean specifically allergy to foods, asthma, or the constant runny nose, allergic rhinitis. Depending on what age the child has depends on what happens, what the presentation is. So if the babies have it, and definitely babies get it, they'll have feeding difficulties and vomiting. Emesis is another word for vomiting. If it starts out in childhood, then they oftentimes have belly pain, chest pain, or vomiting. And if it starts out in adolescence, or adults, for that matter, they'll have heartburn symptoms, They'll have difficulty swallowing, and if it gets advanced enough, they'll actually have episodes of food getting stuck. We have a Staten Island girl who has that happen. So what are some tricks? There's many, but these are, these are some of the ones that I think are important for you to know as far as trying to help get your kids the best care. 
So the blood test. So IgE blood test may or may not be helpful. That's what the expert consensus says. And I found that a minority of doctors actually employ the these type of tests to try to help guide what the allergy might be. So patients who have a normal endoscopy, especially little children or medium-sized children, can still have EOE. So if the doctor says everything looked good, did they do the biopsy? Did they do the biopsy before they gave the child medicine to stop the acid? And hold that thought for a minute because we'll touch upon it, why that's important. How many biopsies? So if your doctor or a doctor does one biopsy, 50-50 chance that they'll make the diagnosis. If they do five biopsies and the kid has the diagnosis, has the condition, they'll make the diagnosis. What we normally do is three to four, and that's gonna give almost 100% yield. Where do they biopsy? Sometimes they get a second opinion where they're all mishmashed together, and it's virtually impossible to make good clinical judgment. So the maximum approach is to take biopsies from both areas, the middle of the esophagus and the end or the bottom of the distal esophagus. And the cutoff that's typically used is to count the number of the eosinophils. The eosinophil is a cell. It's found in the blood. It's found in the lungs. It's found in the skin. It's found in the esophagus. Um, and the usual count is 15 eosinophils per high power field. There have been, in all three of the guidelines, uh, outlined the circumstances. So just saying that they didn't have 15 eos doesn't guarantee that the patient does not have active EOE at the time of the biopsy. GERD is gastroesophageal reflux disease, and in common language, it's reflux. So heartburn or reflux. Why are those two put together? Why? Because they're both diseases of the esophagus, and moreover, the relationship between the two is quite complicated. You can have similar symptoms. So the adolescent who has food getting stuck is the exception. Virtually all the others overlap to a tremendous amount. They can have similar biopsies. They can both have eosinophils on the biopsy. So even seeing that does not guarantee. It's even more intricate than that. So somebody who truly has, truly has reflux and does not have the eosinophil esophagitis, over time, the acid can cause injury to the esophagus and increase the susceptibility of then developing food sensitization or EOE. So one can lead to the other, the other way around. If you have food allergy, it can oftentimes cause a dysfunction of the esophagus. In other words, the esophagus job is to get food from the mouth to the stomach. If it doesn't work so well, we all, everybody has a little bit of acid that comes up, that's normal. But if it's not working as well as it should and the acid stays longer, then you wind up with the reflux. So they're not mutually exclusive and each can worsen the other. And there's a lot of controversy within the field. And as I tell people who come to see me, I am actually not in the mainstream when it comes to this particular issue. The, this is the recommendation, treating eosinophilic esophagitis with the proton pump inhibitor. I'll explain what that medicine is in a minute. So their recommendation is, and this has been already since 2011, in symptomatic children who have biopsies that suggest eosinophilic esophagitis, these children, and in, in essence adults as well, should receive eight weeks of proton pump inhibitor therapy, and then they should have a second endoscopy in order to make the diagnosis. A logical person might say, is that actually makes sense to put a little ch child through two anesthesias, through endoscopies, two months apart, and it's not what I do. And the issue is addressed by the panel, if the first endoscopy is performed after the proton pump inhibitor has been given for the eight weeks, then the diagnosis of esophagitis, eosinophilic esophagitis can be made and treatment initiated. So take home message is that if you're in the scenario, you would 
better benefit from giving the kid the medicine for the eight weeks. I don't like to use medicine. I, I oftentimes take kids off of medicine when they come to me from their pediatricians with the medicine. But in this instance, it's complicated and we discuss it and it's worthwhile to do it this way for the reason I just pointed out. The PPIs and eosinophilic esophagitis. So PPIs are short for proton pump inhibitors and these medicines are the strongest medicines available to suppress the acid that our stomach routinely makes. The dosing is one to two milligrams per kilogram per day. Kilogram is two pounds. The dose is based on the weight. Kilogram, by the way, is two pounds. So if your child is 20 pounds, it's 10 kilos. The dose should be 10 milligrams per day. 40 milligrams is the most you give an adult. So when I see an infant come into my office on 40 milligrams of this medicine, I know there's something wrong. Um, what are the examples? So each company, these are very, very popular medicines, very, very lucrative. So a lot of companies make it and it's just, they're, they're relatively interchangeable with one exception. So it's Prilosec, Prevacid, Nexium, Protonix, those are the brand names, and then omeprazole, lansoprazole, isomeprazole, and pantoprazole. The only exception is that omeprazole and isomeprazole are made by the same company. Here you have a pair of gloves, a right-handed glove and a left-handed glove. That's omeprazole. Only left-handed gloves work in nature. The right-handed glove doesn't work. When their patent ran out, they added one step they removed the right-handed glove, so the left-handed glove got a new patent. So therefore, the left-handed glove is twice as powerful because there's no wastage. So the Nexium, in fact, is twice as powerful as the other groups, as a general rule. Now, besides simply the acid suppression, these drugs might be helpful for other reasons in eosinophilic esophagitis. And that's been my experience, and that's why I have utilized them much more, and I've actually had a lot of arguments in national forums with the eosinophilic esophagitis experts. So the proton pump inhibitors response of esophageal eosinophilia is now recognized and believed to be a separate entity. So what these people at first were arguing with me that these drugs had no value, had no role, now with the introduction of a number of investigations, publications showing, they've, descri they've described a new group. So kids who have what appears to be eosinophilic esophagitis, but everything apparently gets totally better with the medicine. So they have recognized that there's a role for the medicine, but they're not quite ready to say it's the same. For me, if you have a condition where the cell, the eosinophil, is what makes the damage, it doesn't make a difference how they accumulate, once they're there, you're susceptible to having the damage. There are several different options for eosinophilic esophagitis treatment. We're gonna just say one word about it because almost all of the investigators don't talk about acid suppression. They don't include, as I'm alluding to, with certain of the other modalities, and we'll look at that in a roundabout way as we're reviewing the information. But the three classic ways would be changing the diet in three different manners, or using a, another medicine, which is an anti-inflammatory medicine, a steroid. It is the same as a steroid as people use for asthma. It's administered a different way, and we'll touch upon that. So with regard to using the diet, there's three different approaches. One is where you just take all the foods off, and that's quite effective, and you provide nutrition through a synthetic product called an amino acid formula, which has no or virtually no uh, capability of starting an allergic reaction. It's very difficult, as you can imagine. The middle way is targeted, so you conduct allergy testing on the child and based on the foods that are identified on the allergy testing, you eliminate those from the diet. And then the top one is empiric elimination in which you eliminate six foods regardless of what the specific person is involved in. And the other is the steroids. 
um, and they are the same steroids as are used in asthma. However, with the asthma, you get a puffer or an inhaler to breathe them into your lungs, where in this condition, you swallow them down and they go into the esophagus. I use the term there off-label. The only reason why that's important is because, unfortunately, the insurance companies, broiled in a fight right this minute, state that since it's quote-unquote off-label, they don't have to pay for it. So that's where the problem lies. And in very rare kids who have severe conditions, then we might give them, and it would be a temporary, actual course of oral steroids much the same way I would use in a child who has another GI inflammatory condition called Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. There are a lot of questions about what to do. The two important overriding questions which the other ones are derived from is what are the goals of the therapy? One goal is simply to make the child feel better. You don't want to have food getting stuck. You don't want to be vomiting. You don't want to have trouble eating. The second is to have the endoscopy look normal. I don't have any pictures with this talk, but there are actual changes that take place. When I look down, I see them. The third is, should we remove all of the eosinophils if those cells are capable of causing permanent, or what we thought of was permanent damage? And so the next question is, what is the long-term prognosis of the disease? The disease was first described in 1999. So we barely have 15 years. So we have no way, nobody, nobody has any way to say with certainty what is going to happen long term. However, we definitely know certain features. We know that narrowing of the food pipe definitely takes place. And we know that narrowing of the food pipe is a big problem. We know that in one study in where they had 500 kids, stopped only 2% were able to remain asymptomatic, and 98% without any treatment relapsed. So that, you could say, most likely is not a thing you'd want to put your kids through. And then in a much smaller study of 24 kids who they stopped the treatment, over the next six years, they all returned by, by symptoms and when they had a repeat uh, biopsy. So. Although we don't know exactly, we do have a bad feeling as to what happens when we stop treatment. Okay, so let's look a little bit more first at the dietary options. So the elimination diets, again, we're eliminating all foods. We're just having these products. And there is a boy on Staten Island, a very, very determined guy. He's now going to college. Um, he drinks. He has a high number of allergies. He was seen in the centers that are most uh, prestigious in the United States for the problem, and um, drinks these kinds of box drinks. Um, he now drinks about 12 a day. He has been drinking them since about four or five years of age. Um, he's refused the gastrostomy tube. He drinks them by mouth. Uh, he's running track. He's the captain of his high school track team, and he is um, accepted into one of his top choices in college. So he has a lot of determination, but physiologically, he's able to do. For a while, was not eating any food. He unfortunately had a significant and unfortunate personal problem, and he was a teenager. He literally went off the wagon and started to cheat and then regressed. Um, we're now in the process of getting him back on track. But for many years, he did not eat. One third of the patients, if you're going to remove just some of the foods, will do well after removing just one. And we'll get to that in a moment. About a quarter require four or more foods to be removed. In general, there's many, many, many exceptions. The younger the child, the more food you need to remove. In other words, there's certain considerations that you can outgrow what your sensitivities are. By far and away, the most common food is milk. I have always taken the kids off milk, and actually somebody um, did a study that showed that about two-thirds of the kids, if all you did was take away the milk, were able to do well. Um, and that goes along with, with what my uh, own experience has been. I do it with the acid suppression, 
and that's why I've had more success. After milk, the, th the next most common are wheat, soy, and egg. SPT is the skin prick testing that your allergist will do, and APT is atopic patch testing. Both of those are tests that the allergist will do, and only one half of the kids who had a milk intolerance, meaning that they did better when they're taking off the milk, were positive on these tests. So milk, for sure, is not reliable, and conversely, I would take your kids off of the milk. Um, there are no ch tests in what we call a randomized trial is the, the test where there's no cheating, if you will, um, to compare these, which is better, um, so we don't have that available information for us. A minority of investigators, for reasons that I don't totally understand, don't utilize the blood test. Now, the patch test is a completely different type of allergy testing. It's what they call a delayed reaction. The skin prick test looks for a histamine IgE-mediated reaction. You would anticipate that it would take the place of looking at IgE levels in the blood, and that is what the allergist will say. If you look at the data, it absolutely does not support it. So my first step is to do the blood test. It's one blood test. You can have many, many different allergens checked, and then we send them to the allergist with that in hand to build upon it. So the next dietary Sorry, the next dietary approach specifically would be the amino acid formula. As I pointed out, there's various products, and it's just products made by different companies. Uh, Neocate, Splash, Elecare. These are a little bit more established than the fourth one, Nutramagen Amino Acid. To utilize this approach requires no foods at all, and oftentimes requires a gastrostomy tube. Um, I have a little boy from who actually passed his first food test at age five. He was, again, seen by the super EOE centers and was not, um, was not really managed in a way that was appropriate for the child. Maybe it was appropriate for the book, but it wasn't appropriate for the child. So the targeted elimination diet, they use the, the uh, abbreviation TED by the initials, and you do the testing, and again, this is the skin prick testing and the patch testing, and they remove foods based on that. What I'm telling you, when you look at a publication or an article, that's what it is. Or you can do the other approach, which was started by a group in Ohio, the six food elimination diet. Again, those same initials, dairy, soy, egg, wheat, peanut, fish, and shellfish. Fish and shellfish, they count as one. The amino acid formula. The first reported use was about 15 years ago in 1999 in 10 children. Showed it to be very effective. A larger group of 50 kids were able to resolve the symptoms in a little bit more than a week. And when they had a biopsies in a month, uh, almost all the eosinophils went away. So effective and relatively quickly, one month. In adults, 20 adults were looked at, and they also responded in about four weeks. About 52% had response. Maybe they needed to do a little bit longer because they were older. Maybe there was more cheating. Infants and toddlers work best. Why? Because you can control the easiest what they take. Older kids, after a while, want to eat food. The exception are the kids who have a lot of pain. They're, they understand, they get it. So for older children with multiple food allergies, failure to thrive, and severe disease where the other diets have failed, that's usually who reserve the amino acid option for. The targeted elimination diet, and it's again, it's based on the testing. It works about three quarters of the time. Most of the kids find it acceptable. Most of the time, they're able to do the testing. Um, the best testing uh, is for certain of foods, if you're positive, egg, dairy, and soy. Uh, if you match it up with the patch, in other words, you do both things that the allergist, uh, is corn, soy, and wheat. Some studies show not as good a response. It's not clear why. A few people have done what I just said, shown the value of both. I don't know of anyone who's published what I routinely just described to you, the blood, 
skin pricked and the allergy testing, the patch testing. And this group of authors recommended, as I pointed out, eliminating milk, even if the test shows don't worry about it, just because everyone is experiencing that. So with the six food elimination diet, again, about three quarters of the kids do well. One appreciates when one starts this approach that you very well might be removing foods that your particular child could take. In other words, certain kids are going to be able to take soy or wheat or peanut. But if you're following this regimen, you're taking them all away. Another study found only 50-50 help. The duration of the diet has not been as worked out as with the amino acid formula, and it's felt to be longer than just the ones who have the amino acid formula. Remember, in order to get that information, you have to be doing repeated biopsies on the kids. I have right now a patient who's been to the big centers and started the kid on some foods. The kid's doing well. Very first question she came to my office is, when are we going to do the next biopsy? And most gastroenterologists, as soon as possible. I said, let's wait and add another couple foods if clinically everything is good, because to me, it does not, it's against my orientation <laughs> to be sending these kids for the procedure and the uh, anesthesia every six weeks when we know that what's, this is a long-term thing. Is this not, a, this is not an immediate fix? Um, and a recent small study that included children found that the changes that take place in the esophagus when you have active disease, that all of the approaches would be adequate as far as reversing at least some of those. So it certainly gives everybody the ability to choose whatever fits best for your personal situation. So let's you say you, whichever approach you have, the child is doing well. Now, naturally, the question comes, when can we start adding some foods back? Clearly, a stepwise introduction with a small number of foods is recommended. I put this italics in myself because, again, no matter who you're going to go to, there's not a clear-cut roadmap that tells you exactly the best way to do it. It's, not, it's just not known yet. It's recently been suggested, which makes very much common sense, is to start off adding the least allergic foods and to end with the most allergic foods, those foods that were in the sixth group that I said we should remove altogether. How to follow, as I alluded to, is unclear. Should you use symptoms only, or should you do repeated endoscopy and biopsy over and over again? As again, you see, my approach is somewhat of a hybrid. The guidelines state the routine follow-up endoscopy in these children is a matter of local practice. Why? There is no information that we can use to say this is the right approach, this is the wrong approach. Okay, an important thing. We know a lot with adults we starting to see in kids. Sometimes, even though these are not eaten, allergens that you inhale, pollens, grasses, various seeds and trees, they can cause the eosinophils to come into the esophagus and they can there cause the symptoms. So there are no guidelines to address this, but if your child is getting worse GI symptoms around the time when the allergy season is there in the spring and in the fall, that's something that you should discuss. Discuss with your allergist, discuss with your gastroenterologist, and rather than thinking that there's new foods that need to be removed, address the question about aeroallergens and determine if that's going to help. What can you do? You can have a little bit more dietary restrictions. You can try temporarily using the topical steroids. Um, and you could possibly use nasal steroids um, or the regular allergy rhinitis, like a singular, to see if that will help. And again, I caution on the doctor who's going to want to eliminate foods when he does a biopsy in the springtime in the middle of hay fever season. It's my belief, and when I argue with the experts, nobody can counter-argue, why do you believe that the eosinophils that come from one reason perform differently than another? Ostensibly, it's, I'm not saying that theoretically in four years, five years, 
somebody will be able to say, you know what, the food allergy eosinophils are different than the other, than from reflux, but we have no evidence to suggest that that theory is correct. They've maintained it and they've acted that way, but it's not based on anything and in fact counterintuitive to what common sense would say. Especially, especially if the eosinophilic infiltration is in other parts of the GI tract. Or if there's other issues, in other words, maybe there's a change in the diet, maybe they're eating less fruits, maybe they're eating less vegetables, maybe they have runny nose and they're not eating as much, maybe they're not drinking as much, maybe they're outside playing. So you have to, you know, we, we, we look at a lot of different variables before we jump to the conclusion that it's the eosinophilic that's doing it. Dietary treatment is an option, and it's a good one. The specific, this is again, these are the words virtually directly from the recommendations. The specific approach can be individualized according to needs of the child and of the family. Directed therapy after eight to 12 weeks, if the specific allergens are suspected and confirmed by testing, would probably be the way that you'd like to go. Otherwise, you could think about the six food elimination diet and remove all of them. If the child has had multiple food allergies, if he has medical issues that move him into a more serious type of condition with not growing, vomiting all the time, really a good deal of pain, um, and it's not been able to get better with these other approaches, then amino acid formula is certainly a valid option. You need to have good dietary input, either from the gastroenterologist or a dietitian. The first group of 15 kids wound up having medical issues promoted by not getting good dietary advice. So the paper that first described this condition, a little known fact is that those children who were used as the targets to first start the whole field off, they were not treated as well as you'd like to have. The key foods will need to be substituted appropriately. For example, if everybody is gonna be off of milk then everybody needs to have vitamin D and calcium. It must be supplied as a substitute, otherwise you're guaranteeing a disease that we don't ever see anymore, correct? So they won't grow properly, their bones won't grow properly. So that must be incorporated into the plan. And the efficacy of whatever diet needs to be assessed by symptoms. And at some point, not every six weeks if you come to see me, but at some point by a biopsy to show that it's effective or not. So what happens if you have a child who's not responding to the diet? Well, you firstly determine, are they really sticking to the diet? For me, it's very difficult for these little kids is who's watching them, who's keeping an eye on school, who do they stay with in the weekends. So you need to really track that down. You might have to eliminate additional foods. And if we're really not getting anywhere where we need to go and the biopsies are still showing and the symptoms are still there, then we would consider trying a steroid therapy. How about if you have a child who is responding to the diet? Well. In cases of clinical and biopsy remission, you start reintroducing the foods, beginning with the least allergenic. If the symptoms recur when you add back peanut, off with the peanut. If you're starting to see that things are good, then it becomes the question about when do you make the decision to go ahead and see that biopsy-wise, everything is good or not. Okay, so the other approach is the steroid. So unfortunately, there are few what they call high quality trials to evaluate the steroid efficacy. They appear, based on the information that is available, to be extremely effective at allowing remission. However, like many things, once you stop the therapy, the symptoms frequently come back. Now, these off-label use of swallowed steroids, how does it work? The idea is that the drug is absorbed in the esophagus, the food pipe, before it even gets to the stomach. So therefore, there's very little absorption for the rest of the body, and there's very little side effects that you get from the steroid, similar to how it, when you get the puff, you have very little side effects associated with that. They're not, not, not none, just much less, less. And the use of this type of approach is mainly because it is effective and avoids this natural, un 
avoidable toxicity that you get when you take the steroids by mouth for a longer time. The most common side effect is uh, what the babies get called thrush or candida. The older kids can get it as well. And just like the babies, it responds very, very nicely to medicine, usually in a few days, almost entirely in 10 days. So there's two medications. One is fluticasone, or uh, you know somebody who takes the puffer for the asthma. Um, and they've only had small studies, and they've established efficacy in terms of decreasing the symptoms and in normalizing the biopsy. The symptoms resolved in two out of three kids, and the biopsy resolved in half. So that's not great. Again, those studies were done without the acid suppression. The fluticasone, it comes as 440, 110, and 220 micrograms per puff. And the expert opinion, again, it's not proven, is that the doses are 88 to 440, <coughs> excuse me, two to four times daily for children. One study, you know, got the parents to do it four times, and so that's why it's based on. Everybody else does it twice a day. Um, and for the larger kids, the adolescents and adults, it's 440 or 880. So if you're using the 220, it's two puffs twice a day, or if it's severe, or at least temporarily, it's four puffs twice a day. The children should be shown, instructed, explained. I give a handout. They should swallow, and it's not an inhaling. It's the same dose, it's the same device, but it's not, it's just swallow it in your mouth and get it down. And then you don't eat, drink, or rinse your mouth for about a half hour. I let them brush their teeth because sometimes the taste is bad and it helps keep the thrush away. The oral viscous budesonide, and this is first used in a few children who had failed the fluticasone. This is just simply another kind of um, inhaler. This is the pulmacord, and it's this has been effective in 80% of the children. Again, we're not talking about children who also got acid suppression. And the trial of um, the oral viscous budesonide, those are the initials, um, with the PPI, in other words, what I'm doing, almost 90% improved, and the eosinophils almost entirely went away. Some of the kids who had symptom relief still had some EOs per high power field, and they saw no um, adverse effects during the trial. And their recommendations, it's a little simpler. It's one milligram for less than 10 and two milligrams for more than 10. Some people have done it divided in two. Some people have used it once a day. Obviously for me, I like to do things easy. I do it once a day. The only thing about this is a funny medicine is that <coughs> it works best when it's mixed with something that literally sticks to the esophagus on the way down. And so the vehicle that has been written about is sucralose, the uh, dietary substitute for the sugar, Splenda, but it's five packets of Splenda for each half milligram. So for a two milligram kid, you're talking 20 milligrams of Splenda which to me is nauseating. So we have worked with the pharmacists and they've come up with less problematic vehicles to put it in. So how do they, why do these work? So if they don't work, it could be because the kids aren't taking it. It could be because they don't understand the right way to take it. It could be because for whatever reason, they're in the 10% that have drug resistance, and possibly it's not re reaching, since it's, it's a superficial medicine, it's not getting deep enough. The data indicate that the best response takes place in the non-allergic patient and in the smaller patient. It, the smaller patient means to me that if we had it and it was working but not working perfectly, I'd boost the dose up a little bit. So what about if you get the kids to go well? What do you do then with this type of therapy? Symptoms have been shown to return once the therapy has been discontinued. So again, I tell the parents, I tell the kids, this is like asthma, this is like diabetes, this is like Crohn's disease, this is like celiac disease, this is a chronic condition, you're gonna to need to have treatment, and what we need is to A, come up with a treatment that's effective, and B, 
make certain that we come up with a treatment that's effective that does not have side effects for you. Um, they have a study out of Europe which showed the lower dose of the uh, budesonide for a year. In other words, they got the patients in remission. In Sweden, they let the people do anything they want to the, the patients. So they did it for a year. Then they had a repeat study. And it was better than the patients who they stopped it on. But about 50% of them did well. So 50% did well. 50% relapsed on the lower dose. So that's certainly a reasonable thing to try, but you should be prepared to know it's 50-50. So the oral prednisone, it's very effective, but it's rarely used because of side effects. It's reserved for very severe situations. Kids whose disease has progressed, they can't eat. Food is getting stuck. They're losing the weight, and they actually have narrowing that I look at and see. Um, it's 95% effective after a month, both the symptoms and you look at the biopsy, but again, it's not a cure. Six months later, half the patient have relapsed. And the dose is one to two milligrams per day, up to an, the highest of 40. What is the recommendations from this group? You can use the swallowed fluticasone, the swallowed budesonide for four to 12 weeks. The only use systemic steroids in severe cases the efficacy, in other words, the fact that it works, is determined by all three symptoms, endoscopy and biopsy. Biopsy normalization is followed by drug decrease and termination. If the symptoms return, repeat endoscopy and biopsy, and a long-term follow-up of asymptomatic patients, meaning how often they should get rebiopsied, remains individualized. Other therapies, they don't work. Chromalin, Singulair, these six macaptopurine, which are stronger steroid substitutes, uh, biological agents. There are proteins that are found in the body, elevated in kids who have it, so they've created antibodies against them. They've not turned out to be really effective. So none of these are presently recommended to treat kids with EOE. So this is the last stop slide, excuse me, and hopefully nobody here ever has a kid who gets to this. Um, most of the information is for adults, so we're talking about where the food pipe gets so narrow that nothing's going through. And so then what happens is you put a balloon in and you literally blow the balloon up and you rip apart scarring that's taken place. Everybody can imagine that it's not gentle um, and it's at the beginning, when they started to do it in adults, they had a lot of complications. And the complication is that it breaks. And once it breaks, that becomes a gigantic problem because they don't sell esophagus in the store to replace. So it's not a good position to be in. So now they treat them with steroids and dilation, and they're a little bit more gentler in the adults. So they said there's nothing really that much to go on in the kids. But even then, three quarters of them had pain. And even though they opened up the narrowing, when they looked down, they saw the same level of inflammation. So the expectation is that they're gonna keep coming back and back and back, open, open, shut, open, shut. <clears throat> this is only recommended in very few kids where there's severe narrowing. They failed all the other treatments. And the recommendation is to give medical treatment, the strong treatment, to try to minimize the scarring and try to keep things open up. Um, and as I said, if you unfortunately do wind up, at least one thing that's somewhat optimistic is that the earlier reports of frequent complications